Hey guys, Ryan Martian here, and this is the first video of what I hope to be many in a series of me discussing my favorite scenes or sequences in the history of film. I hope to thoughtfully analyze and dissect them in a way that truly explains why I chose these particular scenes. A lot of what I'm going to discuss are my specific interpretations, and if you disagree, that's fine, and I welcome it. Film is an art form, and as such, deserves to be discussed since everyone takes something different away from it. It should also go without saying that there are going to be major spoilers ahead, but here is a fair warning just in case. You have been warned. Today, I'm going to start with 2011's Drive by Nicholas Winding Refn. Now guys, this was hands down my favorite film of 2011. This was one of those films where I still remember to this day my very first time viewing it. I got goosebumps then, and I still get goosebumps every single time I watch it. There are so many great scenes in this film, but today I'm going to focus on the last 8 minutes or so. So let's get into it. Now for me, the ending begins with Driver and Bernie's cell phone conversation. Besides their brief encounters earlier in the film, including the brilliant My Hands Are Dirty exchange, this is the first time our respective protagonists and antagonists have really spoken to each other at length. This conversation is also very important because we finally learn the significance of Driver's scorpion jacket. To briefly summarize the story of the scorpion and the frog, it revolves around a scorpion that needs to get across the river, and it asks the frog if it can ride on his back. When they reach the other side, the scorpion stings the frog and tells him, it's in my nature. This explains not only Driver's jacket, but his entire view of existence. He holds back from delivering pain and death for as long as he possibly can throughout the first two thirds of the film. But once the wheels have been set in motion, he can no longer restrain himself, Hence the infamous elevator scene earlier in the film. They make plans to meet up at a Chinese restaurant to exchange the money in order to spare Irene and Benicio's lives. Now the scene starts with a slow pan moving from the buildings on a street in LA at night to drivers standing on a fire escape outside of another building. It's just one of the many, many brilliant and subdued shots by Winding Refn and a cinematographer Newton Thomas Siegel. The sights, sounds, and colors of Los Angeles are so important to the visual aspect of the story, and this one is bathed in muted whites and blues, giving the viewer a false sense of calmness in order to build the tension even more. This sequence is complemented with the dull oranges and yellows in Bernie's apartment. In both shots, the camera slowly zooms and pans to our characters. In Driver's case, his back, once again prominently featuring the scorpion. In Bernie's case, his face. Now, Albert Brooks purposely shaved off his eyebrows for this film in order to give his character a more ominous presence. I didn't even notice that he did this until this particular scene, and it kind of pays off perfectly. Next, we see Driver while driving. Again. Now, I want to bring up a quick point about the reception of this film when it came out. A lot of people hated it and thought the title was very misleading. I believe one woman even attempted to sue the filmmakers. The trailer that was released in advance of the film probably gave some viewers a false sense of what the film was actually about. But if you stop and think about it for two seconds, the title of the film pretty much says it all. It's not called Zoom Zoom Crash Crash for a very good reason. Alright so back to the film. It's a side shot of Driver which features his face very prominently. There is no musical score, we only hear some faint ambient noise in the background. As usual, he appears to be very deep in his thoughts, and we can almost physically feel his pain via the blank stare in his eyes and his furrowed eyebrows, as if he is trying to hold back tears, and in a moment we will understand why. We hear a one-sided telephone conversation begin, and to the right of Driver's face, we see Irene and her apartment. Winding Refn uses a brilliant crossfade to switch between the two shots, and we are now focused solely on Irene. Driver tells Irene that he has to go somewhere, and that he probably won't see her again. He wants to make it clear to her, though, that the time he spent with Irene and her son was the best thing that ever happened to him. Now this is easily the most devastating line of the entire film. Not only to the characters, but also to the audience. At this point, we pretty much knew that Irene and Driver couldn't salvage what was left of their relationship. But this was the final nail in the coffin. Driver was going to a place where he could never come back from, and any hope of a normal life was long gone. 
During the scene, there is a very faint musical score in the background by the film's composer Cliff Martinez, with musical cues from the standout track Real Hero, which was featured earlier in the film. It's so subtle and very easy to miss unless the viewer is paying extreme attention. Its use is a very nice foreshadowing device for the final events of the film, which are about to unfold. The scene segues to a tracking shot of Driver walking through the hallway of the Chinese restaurant with the camera following him close behind. Once again, the scorpion on his jacket is featured very prominently. The walls and fixtures of the hallway are bathed in yellows and oranges, much like the scene earlier with Bernie in his apartment. This suggests to the viewer that we are now deep within his territory and we may not escape. Bernie promises that Irene will be safe, but he cannot say the same for Driver. He suggests that he should put any plans on hold for the time being, and that Driver will spend the rest of his life looking over his shoulder. Bernie tells him this because he wants Driver to know the truth. And in the next scene, we will in fact find out that Bernie was telling the truth. We now see Driver leading Bernie to his car to retrieve the money out of the trunk. This scene is interspersed with another shot of Bernie and Driver's faces from the side, still inside of the restaurant. Bernie's face is on the left, and Driver's is on the right. This framing technique was also used during their cell phone conversation earlier. Bernie in the bottom left of his apartment, whereas Driver was on the right side of the screen while standing on the fire escape. This shows that the two characters are on literal opposite sides, and that they have been closing in for their final battle ever since. The shot closes with them exchanging smiles at each other. It's important to note that Driver smiles first, and Bernie responds with some hesitation. Driver, almost naively, believes that this will all be over shortly. Bernie, however, has other plans. Bernie, being true to his word, stabs Driver from the back while he's taking the bag full of money out of the trunk. Now, obviously, Bernie didn't specifically say he would stab Driver, but he did warn him that he would have to spend the rest of his life looking behind his back. In response, Driver stabs Bernie in the throat. This is another metaphor for the scorpion on his jacket. When a scorpion is disturbed or fears for its life, it will attack in self-defense without even thinking about it. Driver's almost immediate retaliation, without any hesitation whatsoever, shows that it is second nature to him, and we've seen him react this way many times earlier in the film. At this point, Winding Refn transitions to a shot of both of the characters' shadows, with Bernie slowly slumping to the ground. This was a very tasteful and artistic way of showing the two characters' final battle. We didn't need to see them struggling with each other in a classical action film sequence because the audience can easily fill in the blanks on their own. We've seen enough gore at this point, and it shows respect for not only the two characters and how far they've come, but also to the audience. We didn't need to be distracted by it, and Winding Refn knows he will have our complete and undivided attention in a few short moments. It's also important to mention that at the end of the sequence, Driver's shadow is now on the left-hand side of the shot, as opposed to his normal right. The two of them have switched roles, both literally and figuratively. I also want to briefly touch on the film score during this entire sequence. It's my favorite piece from Cliff Martinez's wonderfully ambient soundtrack, and it's a perfect example of restraint on his part by recognizing what the director was trying to accomplish on the screen visually. Next we see Driver struggling with his wound and leaning back against the hood of his car. As he leans back, the sun comes shining over his shoulders directly into the camera, indicating that a new day and new life is ahead of him. Maybe not the one that he planned or wanted, but this particular struggle is now finally behind him. This is also important to the shadow scene from a few moments earlier. The sun was shining down on him the entire time and, in a way, leading him away from the events that got him to this point. It's a very small visual device used by Winding Refn, but it shows how much he respects his audience. Now, to THE scene, and my favorite of the entire film. It begins from the side of Driver's car, with his blood-stained shoe sticking out from the door. The camera slowly, and almost painfully, pans up from his shoe to his face. He has a blank look on his face, 
in the next minute or so are the definition of excruciating. No sound, no noise, no music, absolutely nothing. Guys, I could not move. I could not breathe, and my mind was screaming, No! This... No! You've got to be kidding me! How could you? Up until this point, I loved every single second of Drive, but I was almost ready to hate it. But then... He blinks. And Real Hero slowly fades in. He turns on the ignition. He leaves the money behind, along with Bernie's dead body, and drives away. Cue all of the goosebumps in the entire world. I don't think I have ever been so relieved while watching a film in my entire life. I have to give all the props in the world to Winding Refn for the absurd amount of suspense this scene conveys to the audience. We have become so invested in this character, and to have him die right after his confrontation with Bernie would have been such a devastating letdown. To be honest, I should have known better, but it just reinforces how well this film was made. Now many people have asked why didn't he take the money? He could have done anything with it. Except for the one scene earlier in the film when Driver suggests to Irene that they could run away and start a new life together with the money, it's obvious he doesn't really care about money. He lives in a small apartment with just the basic amenities, nothing fancy at all. When Driver finally realized that him and Irene could never have a normal life together, the money became completely irrelevant. He was simply trying to save Irene and her son by giving the money back to Bernie. The shot of Driver driving away crossfades into Irene walking down the hallway of their building to his apartment. She knocks on the door and waits a few seconds with no response. If you pay attention, she almost knocks a second time, but stops herself. At this point, she realizes that Driver was telling the truth earlier. He is gone and will never come back. She looks back one final time as if to try to catch one last glimpse of her real hero. And now we come to the final scene and the conclusion of this wonderful film. We once again see Driver, well, driving of course, and it's a shot that has been used multiple times throughout the course of the film. The side shot from within his car that focuses solely on his face. As usual, he appears to be deep in his thoughts and his eyes have a thin sheen of glaze over them. The shot cuts to a view from behind him, but with a nice touch and camera angle by Winding Refn, we can still see his face in the rearview mirror. He has only the road ahead of him at this point. Now that can be taken literally, figuratively, or both. Some have suggested that this is a metaphor for Driver going to the afterlife, and that he actually died because of a stab wound. I personally do not see this myself. I think this is a very straightforward ending, and we do not need to overthink this final scene, because it's all in the title, Drive. I really hope you guys enjoyed my analysis, and maybe even took something away from it. I have to admit, while writing this review, there were a few new things I noticed that I felt the need to include. It just goes to show how wonderful and dense this film is, and even after multiple views, it's fun to catch something new. Truly great films deserve multiple viewings because they keep begging us to come back for more. It's a testament to great art in general. If you guys like this video, please subscribe and hit the like button. I appreciate your support, and like I said earlier, I hope to do many more videos like this. Thanks again.